Well, hey, you guys. Today, I'm going to tell you about the visit that I just made to Excellus Technologies, which is a semiconductor capital equipment company located in Beverly, Massachusetts. And, you know, I got to say, when I got into semiconductors, it was just last fall, it was less than six months ago that I knew nothing about semiconductors. I mean, if you'd asked me what is a semiconductor, I wouldn't be able to tell you. When you research companies, when you look at stocks and you're just using Google, you know, you're typing in questions or you're watching videos, but you're just getting information that everybody else has put out there. What do you find out there that not everybody else has found? So in this book by Peter Lynch, One Up on Wall Street, he said, professionals call companies all the time, yet amateurs never think of it. What I decided to do was to get in touch with one of the companies. And rather than call on the phone, I just uh, sent an email to the CEO. Hi, my name is Jeff. I'm an investor in your company. And I would like to come and visit and take a tour of the company. I got an email back from um, somebody else at the company who said, thanks for your interest. Unfortunately, we are not giving tours of the company. I hit reply to that email and I said, thanks for writing back. Would you have time to get together for coffee? I'm gonna be in town next week. He wrote back and he said, on Thursday at 3.30 p.m. I can make time to meet with you for 30 minutes. So I wrote back and I said, done. At that moment, I went from this like really curious mode, like, oh my gosh, I'm reading my Peter Lynch and I'm wanting to be a better investor. And then he says, okay, I'll meet you. And all of a sudden I was just gripped with fear. Here I am wanting, you know, contacting the CEO, wanting to go and meet with somebody. And then I thought, like, I really don't know anything about your industry. Like, I don't know semiconductor capital equipment. <laughs> I know that their company makes machines that do ion implantation, which is a really important step in making integrated circuits. But that's about it. <laughs> And so I got really scared and I thought, oh my God, you know, what have I gotten myself into? I'm going to go there and if I have the chance to talk with one of these executives, I mean, I could see this being a really short meeting and then in five minutes, 10 minutes, they'd be like, close their notebooks. Okay, nice to meet you. Have a good day. And I'd be like, oh my God, why did I do this? I flew across the country. I live in Seattle. So I went over to the East Coast and... On the day of my appointment, I arrived there early, like an hour early, because I don't like cutting things close or showing up late or anything. And while I was in the car, I went over my notes. I kind of had written questions that I would ask him. And uh, this is the head of investor relations, who's also the company's vice president of marketing and corporate strategy. And so I wrote down questions, I put them in my phone so that when I was there, if I needed to, I could always refer to my notes on the phone. But I wanted to kind of practice the questions so that if I got nervous, like I wouldn't forget what I was, who I was, why I was there, where I was, all that. So uh, I rehearsed the questions and then I recorded a short video. In those last five or 10 minutes before my appointment, all that kind of like nervousness and fear dissipated. It just kind of went away and it gave way to kind of being excited and just interested and like, wow, <laughs> this is really happening. And that's why I say like this kind of changed my life because, you know, I live in a sort of comfort zone where one day is kind of similar to the next. Like there are no big surprises and I'm never really challenged to perform or do something or kind of be at a higher level in an area where I don't have much experience. About five, 10 minutes before my appointment, I got out of the car and I walked across in the front door. And as I approached the reception desk, this man there said, you must be Jeff Luke. And I went like, whoa, <laughs> like for this guy to know who I am when I walked in the door was surprising. This reminded me of something actually that I had read in that book by Peter Lynch. Visiting headquarters also gives you a chance to meet one or more of the front office representatives. Lynch said that mostly what you're trying to get when you visit headquarters of a company is you're trying to get a feel for the place. And that's something that you can't get 
you know, behind your computer on the internet. So he says, uh, Lynch said, the facts and figures can be gotten over the phone or online. But the first thing that Peter Lynch asks when he meets somebody at the headquarters is, when is the last time a fund manager or an analyst visited here? And if the answer is two years ago, I think, then Peter Lynch said, I'm ecstatic. Because he doesn't want a company that everyone knows about that all the analysts cover and all the mutual fund managers visit. He wants something that might be a little bit undiscovered or misunderstood or just not followed by a lot of people. Uh, the guy at the front desk was like the security guy and sort of working reception. And my guess is they don't have like a lot of visitors there from day to day. So he knew to expect me. I was early. I had a chance to chat with him a little. And he said like, so how did you get this? And I was like, what? And he's like, I mean, how did you get this appointment with them? And I said, well, you know, I emailed them and asked if I could meet. And he said, because, you know, like they don't meet with that many people. He said a lot of people contact them and try to get meetings, but they kind of get passed over. So he said, like, what did you do? And I just said, well, uh, I emailed them and I was just really direct about who I am and I was interested in learning about the company. I told them that I own some stock in the company and that was it. Maybe just the fact that, you know, I am a shareholder, so I'm a part owner of the company and I didn't have any other motive. I just really wanted to learn about the company and maybe they just thought, well, you know, why not? And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that towards the end of this video, but I want to keep moving here. What I should tell you here, because this is what I'd want to know if I were watching this video, is why Excellus Technologies? What is it about this company that makes it different from all the other companies out there? And to understand that, you have to understand their specialty. So Excellus Technologies' specialty is ion implantation, and it's an integral part of the integrated circuit manufacturing process. Essentially, there's a step in making a semiconductor chip called doping, where you add an ion onto the semiconductor chip. But there has to be like all of these perfect conditions of temperature and pressure and cleanliness, and everything has to happen in the right order and at the right sequence for this ion implantation to occur. And I, I asked him about competition in their field. I said, you know, because like, I, this is the way I'm thinking about this. Warren Buffett's often thought that a really good question to ask is, if you had a silver bullet and you could take out one of your competitors in your field, who would it be? So that was kind of what I wanted to know from Doug. I was like, what competitor are you guys most like scared of? Or who's your main competition in this field? And he kind of smiled. He laughed, sort of a knowing laugh. And he said, you know, we really don't have any competitors. And I thought, well, that's funny. Like everyone has competition, right? So what he explained to me is that Excellus makes these machines. They're called Purian H series. And they're what's known as high current ion implanters. So they use this high current to implant the ion onto the chip. And they really don't have any direct competitors with this technology. Now, as we got to talking more, I realized there is competition in their sector of the industry, and that is applied materials. So applied materials is like the, the, the Goliath in the ion implantation field. They've been around longer, and they have a lot larger market cap. Applied materials specializes mainly in medium current ion implanters, and Excellus' specialty is high current ion implanters. When taken as a whole, if you combine you know, all of the ion implantation, applied materials at $166.45 billion market cap is 46 times larger as a company than Excellus Technologies, which is only $3.60 billion as of today. Today is the 19th of March, 2024. So just think about that for a second. We're talking 46 times larger applied materials 
Yet, Applied Materials has 40% of the market, Excellus has 30%. So considering that Applied Materials is like the Goliath in this part of ion implantation, and Excellus is like the David, they actually have a very large part of the market share. So to really understand, you know, my question to Doug is, how come the two main players in this whole market are just like right down the street from each other? Because Excellus is in Beverly, Mass, and like 10 miles away in Gloucester is Applied Materials. So what I learned is that actually Applied Materials bought a company called Varian Semiconductors based in Gloucester, Massachusetts. So what's really interesting is that Varian Semiconductors, which was bought by Applied Materials, and Excellus Technologies are both like the two pioneers in this field of ion implantation. And what I learned from Doug is that the people that founded these companies all went to MIT. And the joke within their sector is that they were all driving you know, from Massachusetts up to Maine and they all ran out of gas like on this one little stretch of Route 128. So they just sort of stopped there and you know, Varian Semiconductors was formed and Excellus. So that is kind of the folklore behind it. But this ion implantation has its roots at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So here's, here's like the crux of kind of, I would say, the competition between Applied Materials, which was Varian, and Excellus. Excellus competes directly with Applied Materials in the ion implant sector of wafer front end equipment. The current CEO of Applied Materials, his name is Gary Dickerson, he ran Varian Semiconductors, which at the time dominated the implant business before Applied Materials acquired Varian. Then in 2011, at the time that Applied Materials acquired Varian, Varian had a 75% share of the ion implantation market. In 2022, so 11 years later, Applied Materials share had dropped to 62% with share loss to Excellus. So when I met with Doug in March of 2024, I learned that Applied Materials market share is about 40% and Excellus's is 30%. So think about that. In 2011, Varian had a 75% market share. In 2022, Applied Materials had a 62% market share. And then just a couple weeks ago, I learned that Applied Materials had a 40% market share. So it looks to me like market share in ion implantation has been coming down for Applied Materials. They've been losing market share and it seems like Excellus Technologies has been gaining fascinating. So then the next question I had for Doug is, are there other companies out there who are gonna try to like steal your technology, steal your IP for ion implantation, and then just start, you know, replicating it? And my first thought is, you know, I understand that China is buying a lot of your equipment. So why don't they just buy one and then knock it off, you know, just copy it and then sell it themselves? And so he said, well, they try. He said, in fact, I was just meeting with one of our customers in Japan. And in the corner of one of their labs, they have a Chinese ion implantation machine. And it was turned off. And so I asked him, what's the deal with that machine? And he said, oh, well, we're required to buy a certain amount of equipment from China. It's sort of friendly trade practices between Japan and China. So we have to buy Chinese ion implantation equipment, and we only turn it on when the Chinese come over and visit our factory, and we have to make it look like we're using their equipment. And then when they're gone, we turn it off. We don't use it. And so I, I thought that was a great anecdote. And I asked him, then why don't the Chinese companies like copy your stuff? And he said, well, 
It's not the machine, it's the recipe. So it's the steps involved, it's all of the intellectual property that they own that create this recipe for ion implantation. And that's something that is not easy to copy. And that is why Excellus Technologies has a moat around their specific intellectual property and their process. So another question that I asked him is, you know, how is Excellus surviving through this really tough time? Because I know that you know last year was a great year for electric vehicles and all these chip makers, and then this year is a really bad year. So anyone who's invested in any of these companies who sell chips knows that sales are down a lot, especially silicone carbide chips that are used in electric vehicles. And he kind of laughed and he said, you know, investors are really parochial. They just see what's around them and they assume that's how it is everywhere. He said, but you know, we're doing well. We're still selling a lot of our equipment. It's just not necessarily right here in the US where our sales are strongest. So what he told me is that in China and Japan, their sales are actually quite strong. And that's just what a lot of investors who focus on what's happening right around them right here in the US don't see. I looked at Excellus's investor presentation from February the 7th of 2024. And within that presentation, it says that the company is expanding geographically. China emphasis on mature process technology for a large, diverse group of customers. And Japan focus on power devices, image sensors, and NAND. So it's right there in the investor presentation that Excellus is selling equipment in Japan and in China, and that kind of backs what he said. But again, people who are so focused on what's happening in the United States might miss that. So when I was researching Excellus, I noticed that they had a former CEO who just retired last year. Her name was Mary Puma, and there's a new CEO. His name is Russell Lowe. And Russell Lowe has a whole different background. So what I noticed just reading on the website is Russell Lowe has a huge background in, you know, in physical chemistry. He's been granted 44 US patents for his work, and he's authored over 20 scientific papers. So this guy is definitely a scientist, right? He's a, um, you know, he knows a lot about chemistry, physical chemistry. And Mary Puma, on the other hand, is not a scientist. It seemed like her background was in other areas of corporate work and that she was, I think, even had a background in marketing. And I thought, how does someone like that become the CEO of a semiconductor company? And what Doug told me is that, you know, Mary was CEO of the company around 2000. 2009 when the company was in a lot of trouble. One of the things he mentioned was that during this really dark time, it looked like Excellus might go out of business. She maintained contact through a group called Semi, which is like a trade industry organization among all these different Semi companies. And she was really good at networking and staying in touch with other people and other companies in the industry. And she was also really good at hiring people. So she had great people skills and was really good at building a team. And Doug, who I met with, was one of the people who she recruited to work at Excellus. And so what's interesting is that in 2014, when they were having a lot of financial troubles, they were able to do something which is called a leaseback transaction. And what happened was Excellus was a spin-off from a larger company called Eaton Corporation in 2001. And so when it was spun off, the building that housed their, you know, semiconductor equipment was part of what Excellus kind of inherited. They got the building. And so what they were able to do with this leaseback transaction was to get approximately 35 million dollars that they could use for the company basically to keep them afloat. Well, these $35 million were very important to the company's survival back in 2014. And then two years later, 
in 2016, the company did what's called a reverse stock split. So at the time, there were 100 million shares outstanding, and each share was worth about $1. So the whole company was worth about $100 million. And if you compare that to today at $3.4 billion, you can see the company's market cap has grown enormously just in, we're talking eight years. So what they did was they did this reverse split because he said the problem was when you have 100 million shares at a dollar a share, if your earnings go up by like one penny or if they go down by a penny, it has really negative repercussions with analysts and with Wall Street. But by doing this four for one reverse split, all of a sudden, instead of 100 million shares, there were only 250 million shares. And so there were fewer shares, but each share was worth four times as much. So if instead of like earning one cent for the quarter, you would be earning four cents. And somehow in corporate finance, it was a much better situation for them to have the smaller number of shares and the larger amount of increase, whether it was earning three cents or four cents or five cents, was better than just having that margin of like one penny, either above or below. So what happened was that the company was able to survive mainly because under Mary Puma, they were able to focus on the most profitable parts of their business, which happened to be ion implantation. And they were able to discard the areas of business that weren't doing the company very well. So it seemed like she, took the company through a really tough time and not only helped it to survive, but actually grew the company until now it's a real powerful company and one of the best in the entire sector of ion implantation. So now she and other people who kind of came up with her in the last 15 years are all you know, in their 60s, maybe 65 years old or so. And what they wanted to do was hire the next generation of leaders for Excellus. And that's where Russell Lowe came along. He's a lot younger than they are, and he has this science background, you know, in physical chemistry. So he is now a scientist, and he has the ability to grow his team, and maybe it will be a younger group of people who are going to be able to stay there and grow the company you know, whereas some of the people who are now in their mid-60s might be ready to retire. Where am I now, having had this meeting and have the experience of actually being there at the company's headquarters? And I would say that I am optimistic in that before I went there, Excellus was just ACLS, it was a ticker symbol, it was a $3.6 billion market cap company that makes capital equipment for the semiconductor sector. But like anybody with 15 seconds and a Google search could tell you that. So what I got is a feeling for one, the fact that there aren't really any direct competitors in this high current ion implantation field. And then the other thing that I realized was that they're not having a bad year. Just because other companies in the United States might be suffering this year, a lot of their revenues and their profits come from China and Japan and other parts of Asia. So that kind of opened my eyes to realize like, oh, maybe investors in general have a kind of parochial view of the US being the center of the world, but Excellus could actually potentially be having a good year and we will find out with each passing quarter whether or not this script is unfolding as I might hope as an investor. So I like knowing about strong sales in Asia. And I also like that the stock price is down this year because ultimately as investors, if you know you're going to be buying something for the next several months or years, you want the price to be low. And so to me, I like looking at the stock price chart and see that it's been going down over the course of the year because I'd rather buy a stock like that than chase after Nvidia or something where the stock's just going up, up, up and it's just getting more and more expensive. Finding the hidden gem, finding the diamond in the rough, finding 
a company that's growing its profits while its stock price is going down seems to me to be one of those rare things that I am looking for as an investor. So the market may not see what I see, but that's okay. And I do want to say, none of this is investment advice. These are just my musings as an investor, as someone who likes to learn and likes to understand things. And I'm just sharing this with you guys so that your understanding of this particular company can grow. And in wrapping all this up, I just wanted to share with you the last question that I asked Doug during our meeting, which was, why did you meet with me? And I think he was startled at the question, but I thought it was a good question. And he said, well, to be courteous. And I thought, oh, OK. And then he thought about it a little, and he said, well, you know, because our meeting was supposed to be 30 minutes, and then we were there talking for like more than an hour, maybe an hour and a half. And he said, you know, if you were here from some hedge fund and you were just trying to get you know, information, guidance, money stuff, like I, after 30 minutes, your meeting would have been over. He said, I have some people come in here and they meet with me, and while they're still in here talking to me, they're like on their phones placing trades. You know, or they'll come in here and meet with me and then they'll go out to their car and they'll start trading on the information. <laughs> and I just, you know, you can tell that there's something being an executive of a company like this when you feel like whoever comes to meet with you, whatever the analyst or fund manager is just trying to make a buck off of you, just trying to make money from some info that they're pumping you for or trying to pump you for. I think my approach is just different, which is I want to understand your business more. I want to understand our business more because I own some stock in this company. So it is my business too. I came there on a mission of curiosity. How can I learn more about what makes our ion implantation machinery special? How are we better than the competition? And how is the business doing right now this year? And I learned a lot on all of those accounts. In life, if you want better results, if you want different results from everyone else, you have to do something different. And what was special to me about this little adventure was that I was really fearful going into it. Something about getting out of my comfort zone was just tough to do. But now having done it, I feel like I kind of took this big step. Like I graduated from just typing stuff into my computer or scrolling through my phone and getting data. I feel like I belong in this world where I can actually meet eye to eye with the executive at a semiconductor company or any company and just ask them questions, just share in this back and forth. And really, the one thing I maybe haven't communicated, because I've given you a lot of the answers that I, you know, things that I learned, but it really was just a conversation. Like we had a really nice talk and we were like, sitting across from each other in chairs of this big conference room table, but we were just, it's such a big table, like even though we were just across the table from each other, we were probably like eight feet away. And we were just sitting there kind of kicking back and talking about stuff. And I just asked him a lot of questions about his work and his life. I'd read his bio before the meeting, so I kind of knew like where he went to college and what he studied. And so we just had like a nice conversation, a good back and forth. And so it was just nice knowing that if you do your homework and your research and you're genuinely curious and interested, the world will respond in a really good way. I will be writing a thank you letter to him just as a way of showing that I truly appreciate him making the time to meet with me because he didn't have to. And I think the one thing I could really share with you guys, whoever you are watching this video, is you know, don't be afraid to take chances in life. If there's something that you want to learn about or something you want to do, just go for it. Because a lot of the times, the fear we have about what might happen is just like an illusion. It's just this resistance or fear popping up in your mind. 
but it's not real. And your worst case scenario of what could happen probably will not happen. And finally, it's always a good idea to chase a dream. And I think that no matter what it is in life you want to get done, chasing a dream is never a bad idea. So thanks for taking this time to watch this. Hope it was useful. Now you understand where I went and what I did and what I learned about back in uh, Beverly, Massachusetts. Uh, if you have any other questions about Excellus, um, anything that I maybe forgot to bring up or that you'd like to know about the company or my visit, feel free to ask it, put it in the comments section. And if you've watched this and you're not yet a subscriber, let me know what kinds of things you'd be interested in learning about and subscribe to my channel. I do think this was a really fun video because it's different from everything else I've done and that I actually showed up in person and took the chance and just learned a hell of a lot more than I ever could have if I'd stayed at home and just tried to learn about the world through the computer. So thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.